All right. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, we take this. Tamara is going to talk to us about a very exciting project. Um, and, an, and more interestingly, not only the project, but an idea that she's been working on for at least a couple of years now. And, uh, you know, from she's really, I mean, it's a very new way, a novel way of looking at how we can integrate, um, you know, ecology, conservation, people, all of that together to build stronger and robust, resilient communities. Of course, uh, Tamara is going to talk a lot about it, but uh, a background of Tamara, she's been uh, working in a lot of different capacities for uh, environment, wildlife, um, conservation, and communities, particularly in the Northeast, but all over. Uh, you might, when she starts talking, you'll also notice that uh, it's a very familiar sound and a familiar voice because she's uh, voiced over several documentaries and uh, short films about the environment as well. Tamara, please, it's yours now. Thanks. Sorry, I didn't hear you because I got disconnected and thrown off. So I'm gonna, I'll just start my screen share. Can everyone see the screen? Can you all see the screen? Not yet. Yes. Yes. Now? Okay. So I've been part of a working group um, for the last uh, almost two years now, uh, where we've been discussing this idea of regenerative finance, uh, but with a curated lot from what is called the Regen Network and their foundation members. And basically, we're trying to figure, um, you know, money comes with a lot of, um, we associate money with many things uh, today. And the way what the things we've associated money with and the way it's working for us has has basically uh, it, it's not rolled out too well, especially when we look at uh, the way the economy is defined, the way we define success, the way we define growth, et cetera, et cetera. It's not equitable. It's not um, it's not fair. Uh, it's not sustainable in many ways. And so we've been trying to see, hey, the world is moving. Things are changing very, very fast. Tech is changing very, very fast. And that, and that gap between uh, people who have those opportunities and don't to use these new emerging technologies, et cetera, is widening. Uh, can we have a system that, that revisits um, our idea of money? Can we have a system that revisits our idea of eco-social growth? And that's where all this came into play. And I have to tell you that, you know, this is the first time I'm actually doing something like this, where I'm uh, introducing the concepts to a group outside of the working group. And honestly, none of us have done it. In, within the working group, we have, you know, different members who are working on different aspects of region. But this sort of... Um, education awareness kind of thing has never happened before. And there are a few reasons for it. Uh, ReFi kind of brings together many different worlds. It brings together the social world. It brings together the uh, ecological and environmental world. It brings together data and data science. It brings together uh, technology and internet-based technologies. Uh, many, many different things. So what's happened is there's a huge gap in the way people understand refi. Now, if any of y'all were to Google refi today, y'all will probably find that uh, you know there's a chaotic mess that jumps out of you, uh, jumps out at you from the screen, and it's almost like you're diving down a rabbit hole which goes off into crazy things. You'll find very geeky, techy stuff. You'll find very, very idealistic, philanthropic stuff. You'll you know, and 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 everything in between. So we were like, hey, how do we come out of this? How do we make this something crisp and coherent that, that regular folks can understand? And, and that's where this, this PPT was born in a sense. And um, I'm also going to be sharing it with my working group because we want to see, hey, how are others understanding this? And I have to tell you right at the start, there is jargon. Uh, there is tech jargon. There is uh, learning and unlearning. Uh, there's, there's a lot of basic stuff that we all know, but how are all those basic 
different subjects talking to each other. I hope that will become clearer as we go through the PPT. And the last is also how does Seed Lab benefit from all of this? I mean, why am I talking to Seed Lab about all of this? And I've already given Nandini a bit of an intro some time ago because I had pitched to Nandini about uh, Seed Lab, uh, you know, jumping on board with Regen because values are pretty similar. And I'll get into that more later in the PPT. But I was very keen that this audience uh, really hears about this because I feel Seed Lab is one version of what Regen is doing and what Regen is, is, is trying to create. So without further ado, this is what, this is very simple. How do we look at, you know, resources? How do we look at resource consumption? And what is this bugging? Can you guys see my everything on my screen, including Nandini as a placeholder? Guys? No, we can only see the presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I think this is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the extractive uh, economic paradigm as it is today and how we view natural resources and biodiversity and data owned by communities. So when I say resource, I mean many things. I also mean culture. I also mean data. I mean ind indigenous knowledge. I mean a lot of things. Uh, Sustainable in this sense is a steady state system, but a steady state which is not impacted by anything externally, no risk, uh, no shocks to the system, et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, it's functioning at steady state. What is resilience? It's an, it's an ability to recover when there's a shock or when there's a risk involved. And regenerative is continuous growth. Now, when I say growth, I don't mean growth how we understand it in an economic sense. I don't mean it in a market sense. I mean growth in a regenerative sense. I mean growth in a capacity building sense. I mean growth in a sustainable sense. So this is one basic thing that, you know, try to keep this in your mind as we go through the presentation, this, this last bit over here. So regeneration is what we're after, not even sustainability. It's sort of one step further or two steps further. The other thing, the other basic thing that we need to understand is how did this whole thing of regenerative finance come about? You know, you have your, uh, forget reading this, try not to read it, but you have traditional financial systems which were centralized, which were pro proprietary, uh, closed source. Uh, you had some sort of ownership, some sort of stake in the traditional finance system by the amount of money you put into a bank, for example, or into bonds or however it is. But basically, it was run on monopolies and controlled by power structures. And yes, you could do all types of financial transactions with or without the internet, right? Then came along the decentralized finance movement or DeFi, and that's where crypto jumped into the whole, whole thing. And that was a little more decentralized. They tried to uh, uh, um, experiment with open source money. It was permissionless. It was verifiable by anyone, trustless. By trustless, I mean that you don't need trust in any way in order to operate the system. It's, it's completely open and completely transparent. Uh, it was participatory governance. There were many things, but as we know, the crypto market and, and crypto in general has, uh, you know, it's been through its ups and downs. So crypto here is again, just a tool. Also what the decentralized finance systems were originally built on, which were proof of work blockchain. Blockchain is on which DeFi is built, the technology on which DeFi and smart contracts are built. The proof of work, um, uh, blockchain was very, very energy intensive. So in terms of energy efficiency, even though it was trying to do stuff in a more efficient manner, in terms of carbon footprints, in terms of what it was doing to our natural world, was just, you know, gobbling up more power. And currently, a lot of our power is still from petroleum sources, fossil fuel sources. So, you know, it didn't really work too well. And the DeFi system is anyway working with money built on petroleum. And that, that's a very broad statement, but it basically means that a lot of the way our stocks and shares and money is traded is the, the basis, the collateral is currently, but still very much petroleum and oil and gas. So refi came into the picture 
And uh, ReFi was saying, hey, can we use what's good about DeFi? Because yes, we do want decentralized. Yes, we do want transparency. And, and we do want, uh, you know, immutable contracts and, 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 and immutable records rather. But how do we do this in a way that you create a more equitable system uh, that is more sustainable? And it's working for common good rather than just working from individual to individual or between companies, a B2B or a B2C or, a, you know, that kind of thing. How can we make it something that's for the common good? And, and then this whole movement started out of ReFi. And ReFi, the region version of it, is they use the proof of stake blockchain, which works in a slightly different way. I don't want to get into what each of these things are right now. There's enough information on the net, but if you all really want it, when we do questions and answers, I can get into proof of work versus uh, proof of stake. But basically it means that proof of stake uses about, uh, I think 10 million times less energy than what proof of work blockchain uses. So they've also looked into that angle of, okay, we are using tech as a tool, but can the tech be more green in some way? Yeah, and this is about, financial systems and the evolution to what we call the refi movement today. Then you had the internet evolution. And today we are in the third evolution of the web that we call web three. So it started very simply at where we were just consumers of information. It was one way traffic. It was information centric. You go in there, you, you know, this is when I was studying and I, you know, you, you just did it for research. Internet was there, but you were not participating anywhere. We were just consumers of information. Today, what we also have is the social web and where there are linked apps instead of linked web pages. We are consumers and producers. So it's a sort of a read write situation. It's interaction centric. So it's not passive. It's not a one way street. And the data is unstructured. There's big data, there's cloud computing, et cetera, et cetera. But Web3, which is what we are moving towards, which has already started, but which is not there in everyday life. Today, Web2 is in everyday life for us. But we are slowly headed to a place where Web3-like um, applications are going to be everywhere. And Web3 is what ReFi and blockchain has leveraged. And what is that? It's basically about using not linked apps, but linked data. So you're opening up the system more. It's, it's the semantic web, not just the social web. People who use the web become creators and owners. So it's not just consumer producer. It goes beyond that. It's a multi-way interaction. It is user-centric, but, but if you think as users, not as individuals, but as nodes, and what does a node do? A node connects many different paths, right? So you think of users as a node. So it is user-centric, it's distributed, and it's leveraging blockchain, AI, 5G, and those kinds of things, okay? So this evolution happened, the financial systems evolution happened, and these happened. Today, we are at a point where we have intellect, interlinked planetary crises, that we already know. I think all of us are familiar with these. Anthropocentrism, uh, which is the values that are currently, um, uh, that are there, out there in the world today, and which is, you know, at the root of a lot of our issues. Uh, and the current economic paradigm, which I've already talked about. So you have these three crises in a way. And then you have the evolution of the internet. And that's what gave us refi. All right. Do you want me to do that again or can I go to the next slide? You can go to the next, next slide, I think. Okay. So there are three pillars of refi. One is to stabilize our climate. And how do we do that? By reducing and removing GHG emissions. And you leverage carbon markets. We'll talk about what we mean by carbon markets and markets for nature-based solutions. Restore our ecosystems by con conserving and regenerating biodiversity and natural resources whose value is growing via emerging markets. Okay, we'll talk about emerging markets too. And the third one, which is also extremely important, is instituting social justice. 
So by regenerating local economies via action-based rewards. So not something that is outcome-based. The carbon market was very much something that was outcome-based. I will do this. I will use a method methodology. I will calculate how much carbon I have sequestered or how much carbon I have uh, stopped from going into the um, avoided, uh, stopped from going into the atmosphere or wherever. And that's how I will do it. But this is more about... Where are we? Um, uh, yeah, this is more about action based on participating in stewarding a natural resource, stewarding biodiversity, stewarding any kind of uh, culture that has socio-ecological benefits, knowledge that has socio-ecological benefits. It could even be storytelling. It could even be data, right? And communities of care. So it's all these three. These are not mutually exclusive. Refi is when all these three come together in a project, in a proposal, in a community, in whatever it might be, okay? What do I mean by programming regenerative values into money? How are we doing this? So the basic thing is tokenizing credits for regenerative action. Now, now credits, we already know what it means in the carbon market. It's got a lot of flack also and we'll come to come to it a little later as to why but by tokenizing credits we don't mean that we are using credits as a property here credits are an asset as soon as we say it's a property we are doing exactly what the carbon market did earlier and what other nbs some nbs markets are doing which is we are pricing nature and this is something we need to move away from, because if we see ourselves as part of the commons, if we see natural resources and biodiversity and culture and knowledge as part of the commons, then it isn't actually right to put a price on it. So we're saying that tokenizing in regen balance, for regen foundation at least, means that we are calling it an asset. So tokenizing a physical asset involves creating a representation of the asset on blockchain. So you have a smart contract. Okay. Don't worry about it if it's, um, this is not, this is very, very basic stuff, guys. Okay. This creates a digital asset that can be programmed, monitored, and exchanged. So your smart contract determines how your eco-credits are defined. The eco-credits are then traded on the region platform in region money, the region token, you'll see it later. And that is how we get our carbon and eco credits to become tokenized and move on to the blockchain. Okay, so here we are basically creating a blockchain, which is a collection of records that are proof of eco social regeneration. I hope that made sense. And as more and more credits move, so this is a movement. And what Regen is doing is, um, I would say it's it's a little different from the rest of the refi movement in the sense that we are we are curating eco credits a little bit differently than others. We are moving away from what happened with the earlier carbon markets. It's it's been really worrying that when I've attended refi conferences, etc., that they're still talking in terms of the earlier carbon market and that. That is not something we want to do. It's not just replacing processes, but also embedding values. And that's where Regen comes into play. And that's where we are trying to say that this is a movement that is growing. It's, it's emerging. It's not something that is established. So we want more eco-credits in the Regen way to come onto the chain. Because the more that come onto the chain, the more project owners will earn, the more the price discovery increases, the more transparency and accountability increases and the movement, the region movement sort of, uh, 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 the, the foundation of the region movement is strengthened and planet positive projects become more economically viable. And here, I, I would like to talk a bit about project owners because in region balance again, Owner really means the actual, the real owners of the data, the real owners of the land, the real owners of the practice that is doing it. What happened with the previous carbon market was that project developers jumped on the bandwagon and it became very much a 
uh, a system that was incentivizing the market rather than incentivizing actions on the ground. So a lot of project developers jumped on the bandwagon to earn money from it. And those on the ground actually didn't see too much money. They were more like, a, it was, it, there was a lot of greenwashing involved. And yes, physically there may have been a space, but not too much was going on on the ground. And definitely land stewards, water stewards, biodiversity stewards, conservation stewards, very rarely did they see any of that money. Most of it went in transaction costs because of the way the process was. So we're trying to, uh, the process was made. So we're trying to move away from a market incentive where the market becomes the, the focus to the grassroots becoming the focus, the land stewards and the, and the practices involved becoming the focus. I'll just quickly compare some PES systems because these are the ones that come up the most. And I don't want to go in again, go into it too much. You can read this at leisure, but I want to show you why is regions different? What is this whole hue and cry right now about GOI's green credit program? Uh, and, and what was the old carbon credit uh, system all about? Now, the old carbon credit system, today we are at a point where, um, you know, it's a huge market, uh, the voluntary carbon market is about more than a billion. I mean, if you look at just Vera, it's more than a billion uh, dollars and more than a billion credits were sold. Uh, sorry, sorry, it's billions of dollars and more than a billion credits sold. It's very much an outcome-based market. I've explained what that is earlier. If anyone wants an explanation again, we can do it uh, during um, questions and answers. It was all about pricing nature and offsetting carbon. And, and this thing between offsetting and insetting is very, very important. Offsetting carbon means that something happened which was not really great. And you're sort of buying insurance for that by investing somewhere else and helping them uh, move forward uh, in a carbon neutral way. However, you're not doing anything. It doesn't necessarily mean that your actions, wherever you are, and this was mostly the global north, that they were actually changing what they were doing. If someone was rich enough to keep buying carbon offsets, they didn't really have to change the way they, they did their uh, business, right? Or they didn't have to change the way they uh, interacted with uh, communities on the ground or the way they or the values that they had. Nothing of that had to change because all they had to do was be rich enough to just buy your offset. So as in general, we're as a refi movement, we're against that kind of um, uh, how do you say we're against that kind of inequality. We're against that kind of opportunity that keeps some people out and some people there and also against it because then you're just, it's like putting a bandaid on something. What GOI's credit program claims to be doing is doing insetting, but it's actually doing offsetting and offsetting is still, it's very much based on the old carbon model. And India did get a lot of money came into India uh, from the early 2000s onwards when the first, uh, uh, when the whole Kyoto Protocol and the clean development me mechanism, et cetera, et cetera, were current. Tons of money came into India. And this is what GOI is looking at. GOI is not looking at um, carbon credits as, as something that the, re, the way the refi movement is talking about it. The only difference here is GOI's carbon credit, uh, GOI's credit program is looking at carbon plus water plus many, many, many things, but they haven't been very clear about how they are going to, what is the fungibility between all these different things? How am I comparing carbon sequestration to saving water to planting uh, to planting trees to having an energy efficient system somewhere nobody knows right uh, the carbon credit system as i mentioned earlier uh, high costs needed large volumes of credits to balance out transaction costs if at all it was very much trust based because what happened was valid validators had to come and come to the grassroots uh, do a full report and based on that report your credits were issued and based on the number of credits issued and the credits were then traded on the global platforms and then you got the money so it was a very it was a very uh, complicated uh, it was a rigmarole and it was really not possible for uh, project owners to do this themselves. And of course, there was high energy consumption with all the traveling and the and the computing and the this and the that and whatever so out of the question. GOI's green credit program, we, uh, the reason I put it in here is because today was the last day for comments uh, as part of the Vikalpsam, uh, Vikalpsangam group. 
uh, we have responded to the draft notification and, and written a whole lot of things, but it seems like, I, I think it just looks like something that was just put out there for the heck of it and it's going through anyway. Uh, so I don't think any of our comments are going to actually <laughs> be taken into account. But anyway, this, the system is coming. We don't know how they're going to look at other systems, whether the government is going to force us to say, hey, no, you have to look at only India's GCP and you can't look at any other systems. Or will there be fungibility between India's GCP and, and other um, uh, credit mechanisms? We're really not sure. But uh, we, uh, as Seed Lab, we do need to be aware of it because a lot of the work that's going on, this is going to come up. Uh, there are already... Uh, corporates and teams getting together to discuss how to jump on this bandwagon and how to make money from it. So uh, it's it's a very, very worrying thing, as worrying is, as our uh, forest conservation, the, the bill, the amendments that are coming. So uh, these are things to, to just keep in mind that these are some of the fallouts of pricing nature in, in a way and, and looking at NBS in this way. And Regen, on the other hand, is looking at high integrity eco credits. And high integrity means uh, eco plus social, plus culture, plus, plus, plus. And when we say social, we mean values. Uh, we mean values of gender equity, uh, eco feminism, uh, all those things, equal opportunity, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that's high integrity. Uh, it is practice based, it's not outcome based, as I said. So we're rewarding regenerative practice. We are rewarding stewardship of the commons, however it might be defined by a community. Sometimes it's not defined by a practice. It may be defined by a culture. It may be defined by knowledge that they hold. It may be because the knowledge that you hold is telling you, okay, I don't do this in the forest in the, at this time of year, et cetera, et cetera, something like that. So Practice-based, however, one might define that. And, and Regen is open to defining it in any way that is practical. Um, this is about insetting ecological health. That means I'm actually practicing stuff that is good for my ecosystem. I'm not saying it's going to happen 10 years hence or 20 years hence. I'm doing it right now. It's part of who I am. It's part of stewarding the commons. Okay, so we're rewarding that and eco-social health and carbon. It, it includes everything. Okay. Why have I said dynamic cost? Actually, the cost is pretty low because one, there are no um there are no uh people in between, there are no middlemen. It's literally just the community and region, and whoever chooses to represent the community or the group or whatever it is to region. That's it. So there's no such thing as coming in there and monitoring and doing this and doing that. Sure, there is a process. There'll be methodologies if we are actually putting out credits. But other than that, there's, there's nothing that is bureau, bureaucratic about this. It's, it's more about trusting uh, the people and the system. And why that is so is because communities who come, who do these eco credits with region, who make eco credits with region, are actually owners of the region network. And, and I'll explain to you how in, in, a, in a few slides down. Um, definitely quality over quantity. So that there's no such thing as needing a certain number of eco credits in order to be able to participate, etc. Economies of scale have absolutely no uh, uh, no bearing in, in this case. Again, trustless and high integrity and very low energy consumption. We've spoken about that before. Um, proof of stake versus proof of work. Okay. Now using blockchain and crypto as drivers of good. How? So there are many articles here, but I'd really, if you all have the time, this is a short article. It's a really good article that talks about purpose-driven communities empowered by blockchain and Web3 technology have the potential to address climate change, biodiversity loss, and social structures that got us here in the first place. Okay, and what all that means is, is, is there in that article. Regen has leveraged that kind of thinking and has created an open source toolkit to measure, value, and improve the health of our natural world, and to align our economy to regenerative socio-ecological outcomes, how? Using high, eco, high integrity eco-credits. 
How do we do this exactly? We work alongside land stewards, biologists, data scientists, others, like the region community is huge. And it has already developed over 40 plus methodologies uh, with 12 million hectares of ecological regeneration in the pipeline. So projects have started. We have one such project in India, in Andhra Pradesh, uh, which uh, you know I can give you these names and stuff, or put it in the chat later. But if you all want to learn more about this stuff, there is that I'll be sharing this with, with everyone, a copy of this with everyone. So you're most welcome to go there and, and, and check out what all those numbers mean and you know the 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 stuff there. So region network, and this is who I've been working with. In a nutshell, you could call it a collection of communities, technologies, and practices that rewards regenerative, regenerative stewardship of our planetary commons. How? These are the different values. Okay. And the main thing about region network is that it was started by people who were in the Gaia University. So there were two people. Uh, one of them is still with Regen and one has left now. And Gaia University basically uses action-based learning. So being iterative, being in an experimental mode, trying out new things, uh, working outside the box and sort of approaching a goal in, in, in incremental steps is what is actually part of the system. It's a feature of the system and it's not a bug. So Gaia University basically says that learning or, or eco-social regeneration is, is more about uh, not having all the solutions and, and putting in stuff, oh, I'll do permaculture here and I'll do this there and I'll do that there. And no, it's not like that. It's more about saying, I'm going to try this because we are all the commons, including the human beings. We're all part of the commons. You're, you're, you're stretching that idea of the commons to not mean just what the tragedy, the tragedy of the commons meant. So it's, we're not just talking about tradable natural resources or, or mutable natural resources, but we're talking about an ecosystem with relationships where relationships are key and not the amounts of things um, or the quantities of things and people and diversity within that system. So Regen is saying, hey, come on board. We are learning and we'd like to learn with you. And because this is a, a movement, because the, re the refi uh, movement is emerging, we are trying this version of it. Can we have a system of governance where people who align with this, whose values align with this, are willing to come on board, use their region tokens and vote within the network for things that they consider for the common good. And that way you're, you're building up a, a, a sort of economic paradigm slowly, an emerging economic paradigm, where people with similar values rooted in communities of care, rooted in socio-ecological um, um, action and rege socio ecological regenerative action uh, where they're able to all come together and say this makes sense i'm voting for it and that way you're building out there's more so this is what regen is currently there's regen network development which is a for-profit organization uh, that's where all the tech and everything else sits uh, that's basically your blockchain and other stuff and all the all the beautiful um, the, the technology sits there, uh, your framework sits there for the processes. Then you have Regen Foundation. Uh, I'm part of the CS, I'm part of a cohort and a CS DAO, which is part of the Regen Foundation, which is the not-for-profit arm. And 30% of all Regen tokens from the from Regen Network Development come to Regen Foundation for the sole purpose of being used by communities in the work that they do. And Regen Foundation gives up to 5 million to each community staking DAO. DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. It, so the Seed Lab could very well, the Canopy Collective could very well be an, uh, a, a DAO. So we would get a kitty of half a million Regen to do the work that we do. 
but then to also participate in the network. So if you see that little cross in the center, the green cross with the arrows going in all directions, I talk about ownership of region, I talk about governance, I talk about knowledge sharing and treasury. So what happens is once we are part of this community staking DAO or the region commons, which is the connection to the grassroots, which is connection to the communities that we actually work with, we have this kind of agency. We have the agency of governance, of knowledge sharing, cross-pollination learning, peer-to-peer -peer learning, the treasury that we hold of half a million region tokens. And we have ownership of region network. And this is really the crux of everything because there's no other protocol that exists today that actually allows ownership of its network or ownership of its protocol. And the reason they're doing this is because they're saying the more you own and the more you govern, the more value you get out of the system because you're informing the system as to what matters to you, what matters to your practice and what is working best on the ground. So over time that, that grows and grows and grows and it informs the kind of eco credits that come out of the system. It informs the kind of social values and ecological values we, we have on the ground. And the region commons is all the different community staking DAOs. And the reason we're using this word staking also, it's, it's in the next slide. I know there's a lot of jargon. I'm really sorry for that guys, but we'll, 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 we'll come to it slowly, okay? So, Community staking DAOs, they don't have to generate eco-credits to be part of the system, no. Just by virtue of holding half a million uh, region tokens, you are part of the system, you are owners of the network, and you participate in governance, okay? You participate via the cohort calls in, in knowledge sharing, et cetera, et cetera. If you want to develop eco-credits, you may. You can do it on your own steam. You can do it as part of the region network with their scientists and their methodology developers. You can do it via the region commons with people who've already done this work before and are willing to do it with you. And that's what we do. We do co-create. Co-creation is a huge aspect of this, co-creation and sharing of, of what we know with each other. So that happens. The eco credits are then, they go onto the region ledger, which is basically your blockchain, a collection of records on the blockchain. And once they are there, they sit as credits there, which are sold in the marketplace. It's a small market right now. It's a niche market right now, but it's a growing market. Biodiversity credits are becoming a very big thing. They're becoming like what the gold standard voluntary carbon credits used to be. That is what biodiversity credits are coming to now because a lot of people are saying, hey, just bringing everything down to carbon doesn't make any sense. We need to go beyond carbon. So how, how do we do that? And anyway, so that's all there in the marketplace. From the marketplace, you buy in region, it goes back to region network development, et cetera. So that, that's your whole cycle. This whole thing is called the region network. But the region commons is, is really what we're interested in. Now, let me just come a little bit back to this whole idea of the community staking DAO, okay? So I had said this earlier, the continuation of the ideas of the commons, you become stewards of the biosphere. I'm not gonna say biodiversity, I'm not gonna say uh, you know, water and land, I'm gonna say biosphere because we mean relationships, we mean everything in that area, but we're also talking about data. So this is not just about living things and natural resources, it's also about data, okay? And how do we justify the valuation in the region economic system? So by participating in the region system, by participating being a, uh, by being a CS DAO, you are informing these things and helping the idea of the commons and the idea of regenerative finance, the premise of all the values that we hold dear and we think are necessary for a regenerative world. We are part of that system, okay? A CS DAO has embedded values such as self-governance, solidarity, interdependence, collaboration, co-creation. I've mentioned all these things earlier. But as a DAO, we need to have that. And Seed Lab, definitely, I, I feel that a lot of the conversations, uh, you know, that I've had with Nandini and that I see you guys when you guys are presenting, uh, I feel there's a lot of alignment with region. Seed Lab is almost like a, a small region. 
minus the whole Web3 space. But the way we are doing our work, the way we look at collaboration and co-creation, the way we uh, see community members, uh, the way we involve, uh, the way we, uh, uh, our values uh, of gen gender equity, our values of, you know, our, uh, uh, how we look at violence in, in its various forms, how we look at various things. It's very much aligned to how, what region is doing and how region looks at stuff. So this embedded values is a very, very, it's actually the key uh, to everything that region is doing. And the CSDAO program is structurally by design. Okay, this is very important. Incrementally moving the entire system to regions themselves with the earth as the house. And that's what I meant by the slide I was talking about programming values into money. How are we growing the system over time? So participation, and this is very important. It's not just about creating eco credits and putting them out there to get some money back in the bank. It's being a part of a larger global platform, which is a movement of sorts, where we are saying, hey, these values matter more, okay? Uh, there are two ways in which uh, a community staking DAO can use their tokens. One is, like I said, uh, as governance tokens to vote for stuff in the system. And the other is as a reward. So I stake my tokens with a validator. I say I have a treasury of half a million region tokens. I'm going to stake some of them with a validator. A validator is the equivalent of a miner in the proof of work system. The validators keep the system ticking. They keep minting new blocks on the blockchain. So by staking my tokens with a validator, the validator is able to use those tokens to create more blocks on the chain. And the validator earns rewards and he will say, hey, I'll give you an interest of what, 7%, 10%, it can go up to 30%. And that's how you earn money. You do not earn money on the half a million region tokens that are given to you as endowment tokens. Those are to be used to stake with the validators and to vote for governments, the governance. And the interest you earn on that is what is in your kitty. It can be up to 35,000 USD a year, but it depends on network participation. The more people participate, the more they earn. And that's how the system works. It's all about collaboration and co-creation, okay? To get started, what would Seed Lab need to do? Uh, we need to be an endowment grantee. Uh, so Nandini and I actually have a call on the 2nd of October. Uh, we have uh, written out a small proposal and Anuja has also done it. So Anuja, Nandini and me worked on this. And um, they've called us. Uh, to see if we can fit and Nandini and I are going to get on a call with them on the 2nd of um, August so we may be an endowment grantee so that half a million region I was talking about we could be a methodology developer so the way I see it a lot of the work seed lab the seed lab is doing at the grassroots within the different working groups uh, technically does qualify for methodology development it just goes to see uh, a how much time we have uh, to put into it and, and be who are the people within region whom I can reach out to to help us do this work because I don't think we'll be able to do it on our own and we need very dedicated work when we're doing methodology development it can be pretty intense it's very exciting but it's it can be pretty intense uh, so that so we're parking the methodology development part of it for now uh, but that doesn't mean to say that if someone suddenly gets a brainwave or someone thinks of a way to uh, sort of tokenize any of the work that they are doing, uh, we could talk about it and I'll be really happy to do that. Or you're an eco-credit source, or you already have your methodology, you already have everything, you, you just, you know, you're, you're already selling, maybe you already have a, a running, uh, the BMC in Changlang, uh, Changlang Shu, for example, you'll already have it up and running. So it's technically an eco-credit source. Uh, I'm sure there are already methodologies out there that we can piggyback on that talk about carbon sequestration or talk about you know, uh, ecology and other stuff and, and, and the benefits of having a, a BMC, like uh, uh, of having a, a biodiversity conservation area in a sense somewhere. So how do we, um, uh, how do we tokenize these things? It's, 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 it's doable. And we don't have to develop a methodology from scratch for that. 
we already have a project running we all it's all it's pretty similar to stuff that's been done around the world so we just pick up anything and use it so regen is very uh, methodology neutral they are very very open to using any kind of methodology as long as obviously it it makes sense and it's practical okay so once we are that we've got into the system then we open a kepler wallet which is currently it is a multi sig wallet that's what regen is 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 doing it used to not be a multi sig wallet but now we have made it a multi sig wallet so that many people uh, have access to it of course trusted people within the cs dao who can um, who have different um, functions associated with the wallet. I'm sorry if this sounds very cryptic, guys. Uh, uh, these are all big subjects in themselves, but this is just to show the CS DAO side of things. So anyway, uh, you have a multi-sig wallet, and that's the wallet you use to send, stake, and receive region and to manage your kitty. Uh, what you stake with a validator can be converted to fiat. Fiat means regular currency. I convert it, can convert it to USD. I can convert it to INR. I can convert it to whatever I want, right? And the thing about being an endowment grantee is that one does need to attend cohort calls at least for the first three months to be part of this peer-to-peer -peer learning network so that you get to understand what is this region system all about. It's it's quite it's it I this is heavily heavily simplified and if I'm sounding a little um, if I'm doing um a lot it just means that it's it's many systems together and it's taken me this this much time to actually be able to condense it and and show it to you all this way okay so there's a lot to learn and this thing about being part of cohort calls is very very important and we realize that being part of cohort calls is the way we learned quickest it's not that there isn't stuff on the net in fact there's too much stuff on the net and if you end up joining discord ch channels or if you end up uh, joining a twitter group or something it's going to be even more confusing i would say stay away from those things for now if Seed Lab does become an endowment grantee and we have designated someone to be part of that, let them be the person who comes and talks to, gives, you know, shares what they learn back with Seed Lab. Because otherwise it's it's really very difficult. And what Regen is doing is, is slightly different to the regular refi movement. I told you that the refi movement is currently still a little bit caught up in, in, in the old carbon market structure, even though it wants to do better stuff it's not sure how to do it region is actually doing it region is actually saying hey there is another way and actually doing it okay um these are some reading and resources and and that's it for now any questions <laughs> any questions guys there are a few questions on the chat box. Okay, let me have a look. Is there a risk of stakeholders coming in between grassroots level group and region? No, Manisha. No, none. Because this is all on um, this is all on blockchain. So unless you're part of the system in some way, you you can't jump. You can't just suddenly jump on board and be part of it. It's it's it's. Uh, uh, Blockchain cannot be like once it's once a validator mints your contract or your information or has your records on the blockchain, that block cannot be changed in any way. It's completely immutable. So it's a very secure, it's a very, very secure system. And that's why this whole thing of middlemen is completely ruled out. Even a Gaon Buddha may not be able to come if they've not, they are not part of that CS DAO, generally speaking. Why does this vocabulary sound a bit scary? Does this have a history of misunderstanding? Yes, Nandini, excellent question. It should be scary because it is very scary. The current uh, carbon market is scary. The GCP is scary. Uh, India's green credit program is scary because it's all built on the current economic paradigm, which is extremely extractive and exploitative, as we have seen. And we are we are sort of living examples of that. This is what we're trying to change with Regen. 
but changing that means you're you're actually changing the the way the world is viewing money the way the way the world is viewing success and that is really really difficult but it's happening it's already happening any other questions there nandini can we go a little deeper into that question did you have anything particular in mind no i just wanted uh, like when even when you first told me about the concept i was like okay i don't know it sounds very intimidating and i was it felt like okay there were lots of barriers to understanding or even figuring out what are the pros of what are the cons of it uh what also it truly is and what it truly means so i was wondering is there a history that um where this like i saw initially it was an apprehension and uh like also sort, sort of like a block initially but now i've started reading also more about it and trying to understand our work a bit more which makes it easier but is there something that we are missing was my initial khan yeah yeah i don't i don't think so i think uh, you know i think tejaswini also has a question is there a methodology to evaluate projects so tejaswini there's not one methodology there are many uh, in one of my slides it said 40 plus methodologies already and those are just regen methodologies there are many 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 methodologies in this place for different types of regenerative activities including for blue carbon which is ocean carbon and so many other things right and what regen is basically saying is use any methodology as long as there's rigorous science to back it but also proof on the ground of regeneration proof on the ground of something working or we're moving towards something that's working right an action that is considered positive rather than an outcome which nobody can really see and it's based on a very cryptic methodology that no one really truly understands and you know the basis for this is i'll give you a very simple example we talk about um, you know carbon in the atmosphere can stay for 10000 years okay and the carbon market the conventional carbon market used to say hey you plant so many trees you're sequestering this much carbon over so many years but how long is that tree lasting what is the life of a tree Uh, is the life of the tree ten thousand years? Are we guaranteeing that we aren't, right? So there's a temporal dissonance in a way that we look at these things, which is why they said, "Hey, all this outcome-based methodologies is really not working for anybody. There are too many things up in the air. It just boils down to theory. It's boiling down to people just, uh, you know, having to pay for their, um, for destroying the planet." and pay in what way pay means i can afford it so i'll buy my credits and i you know offset my actions and there were so many things that were just terribly wrong with that system and i know that you know in india when i i was part of this in in 2005 and i remember that our uh, we had a renewable energy project in in kirugaval in karnataka it was a 4.5 megawatt biomass gasification uh, plant that was doing rural electrification we couldn't get money from anywhere it, it was just not happening and finally even though there were all these schemes etc from goi but nothing was nothing was working for us and finally this uh, uh, we met my climate they were then called my climate today they call south pole carbon and in those days they were, it was just a group of students and they were working on this whole thing of voluntary offsets etc etc and they said guys why don't we try this out and you know why don't we talk about high integrity uh, credits and try and do something and we actually managed to um to get registered as the first gold standard project in the world but we still had so many questions even that time we with the current carbon market and honestly the only reason we did it that time is because that was the only way to get money for that project which was desperately needed in in that area for many reasons uh, you know i'm not going to get into that project as as such but um we've we've come out of that i mean the reason i got out of it even in those days was because i just wasn't okay with many ways in which the carbon market functioned i just thought it was a very unfair market but goi's carbon uh, um green carbon what is it green credit program is it's like a copy paste of of the conventional carbon market and it's very very scary and i think it's important for 
people like us who are trying new stuff, whose uh, whose values are aligned with a regenerative culture uh, in so many ways. Again, I mean, uh, people, planet, uh, data, everything, uh, sovereignty, resilience, democracy. Uh, how do we bring all this into the, the manner in which we, uh, in our relationships, work out with each other and a manner in which we help people at the grassroots rather than them having to have some sort of crazy agency to be able to participate in a green credit program or a you know or a or the or the or the vera carbon market or something how how would they do that how would our grassroots people do something like that these are mechanisms pretty much for people who have that privilege of learning and education and whatever whatever region is saying that's not fair okay region is saying that current eco economic paradigm is not fair. The current model of success is not fair. The current way we look at data and quality and sustainability and resilience and sovereignty, et cetera. We, we need to be able to tokenize, not monetize these things so that it's an asset and people are actually rewarded for conserving, preserving, regenerating that asset. And you know this this was always going to be a very, very difficult talk because I've come here after being almost two years with that working group. I've been able to distill it down to bare basics. But it took me quite long, honestly. So Nandini, I'm completely with you in this whole thing about it sounding scary because initially even I used to be like, shit, when am I, how am I ever gonna wrap my brain around so much? One is that you don't have to wrap your brain around the tech. The tech is for the guys who do the tech. The only thing we need to learn is how to use our wallets, how to use our wallets to wallets to vote for things that we like, not vote for things that we don't like, or say we are, you know, there's also such a thing as a zero vote, but you just say that I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to, you know, abstain from this for whatever reason, right? So there's that. But other than that, from the tech side of things, we don't really need to know anything because ours is primarily, we are concerned with being a CS DAO, which is a community staking DAO. We are concerned with being, thanks Tejaswini, we are concerned with being, um, with fostering the values that we consider regenerative via the work that we do with the communities that we work with. And we are concerned with participating in governance because that is going to say, hey, this is where we are adding value to the movement so that the movement can grow and the way we value things can grow, can change, not grow, can change. The way we value things can change. Yeah, Rohit. Thanks, Tamara. Just had a couple of other unrelated questions, uh, if that's fine. Go ahead. So just wanted to uh, understand this ecosystem better. So yeah. uh, the first one is, do, do you know what the revenue model of the for-profit arm of Regen is? And two, huh. and is, uh, do you know what project is underway in Andhra Pradesh, just so that we get a flavor of what, what kind of things are happening? in this part yeah, of the world. So, okay, so uh, the first one, all that information is easily available on the net. The first question that you asked me, it's all publicly available. Uh, if you go to my slide, the last slide, which is the Regen Network uh, website, you will get all the information about the first part of your question. Uh, the second part of your question, uh, which was what, Jun, again? Whether we know what uh, what's happening in Andhra. Yeah, yeah, so we do. So GVK is a, a Grameen Vikas Kendra. Uh, it's a farmer's uh, a market for organic produce. And uh, GVK is the one that has created methodologies and eco credits for their, for what they are doing. And they're actually selling it now. And because, uh, so th there's another thing here, which I did not mention in my um a presentation because I didn't want it to go off onto another tangent, but there's the whole legal side of things. And the legal side of things for India and crypto is very murky right now. It's, it's uh, well, not murky. Murky is the wrong word. It's hazy right now because we're, we're not very clear about uh, India's GOI stand is not very clear on this. And while it's clear that people can, for their own personal benefit, uh, trade in 
crypto and do things in crypto uh, for um, NGOs, developmental organizations, collectives like ours, how that pans out is, is not clear at all. And what we had discussed about early on in Regen as part of the working group was um, how do we then, how does one then participate? Because we don't have an FCRA, we don't have a legal uh, document to say that we are a, you know, a group or a society or a trust or any of those things that are legally in legal parlance what's recognized. So we came up with this idea of a fiscal sponsor, and it basically means that an NGO sitting in Europe or Singapore or even the US will hold our wallet for us and transact on our behalf. And whenever we need money, they convert it to fiat and send it to us. Okay. And they send it to us how? Via whoever the sponsor is. Is it a university? Is it one of our, you know, do we have a foundation? Uh, one of us in the network has a foundation. Whatever it is, we're very open to channels of transferring tokens to people. So it's not that, oh, India has these laws and this and this and this. So no, region is not going to step into it. It doesn't work that way. We're very open to, to, to trying out things because this is not about putting more barriers to use. This is about lowering all those barriers because as it is, it seems like there are so many barriers. You know, conceptually, it's, it's complicated. It is complicated. Tokens versus money versus coins. Don't confuse this with Bitcoins. It has nothing to do with Bitcoins. Today it's a token, tomorrow it could be something else. It's, a, it's just a representation on blockchain. Why blockchain? Because blockchain is immutable and transparent and verifiable and trustless. So then you don't need all those middlemen. Okay. And Anuja, you've asked, uh, what exactly are the tangible benefits of the tokens for people in there? So two tangible benefits, I call them staking. And there are two types of ways in which a community staking DAO gets benefits. One is that you get to participate in governance. So you use your tokens to decide on whether something that the region commons or the region network or region foundation is doing is good, bad, or ugly. And you say, hey, I like this, or I don't like this because da, da, da. So your, uh, those governance tokens allow you to be part of the network and own the network. So you have a say in what is considered kosher and what isn't. And the second way is by staking your tokens with validators who run the network, who actually mint the different blocks. So again, staking, don't worry about it. It's not anything technical. All you're doing is I have my wallet. These are all the, there's a whole way to do it. These are all the validators. I choose a validator. The validator will say, this is the percentage I will give you as a reward for you giving me your tokens to stake. And they'll stake those tokens, you get those rewards, and you can convert that money to cash and use it for your work. Yeah? Oh, super. Okay. And there's a lot, guys, there's, there's tons more to this. I've actually tried to, I've tried to, you know, dive down to the essence of really how this movement started and then what is Regen's take on the movement. So how is Regen tried to better what the refi movement is aiming to do? And then what is Regen exactly? And the main thing to remember is that Regen is not something that's set in stone. Neither is the structure, nor is what they're doing set in stone. They're very open to iterative positive action and moving towards something that's better and better and better. But in order to do that, Regen needs communities on board. And Seed Lab is very much a community that, that fits well with the ethos of, of Regen. The ethos is the same. Yeah? Anything else, guys? Yeah, they just Hi. Hi. Uh, so I have two things. One is yeah. uh, token mining in itself has been criticized for being quite energy intensive and time consuming. Has yes. the region addressed this in some way? Does it compensate it in some yes. way or something like that? Okay, and that's one. Also, the second one is, uh, since this is about regeneration, so when we define a project, that does that mean every year you evaluate what is the impact and there's a continuous flow? Uh, do you earn money periodically? Do you earn tokens periodically? Or is it uh, 
I'm a little confused about how that works. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, you do earn, you you do earn periodically because we're assuming that your actions are not static, that one thing leads to another, leads to another, etc. Or if it's an action that is static but is required to keep something at at a you know at a certain state or whatever, then it's it's going to be a, a one-off thing. So I think it's a bit of both, but mostly it's every year. Because you revisit and you say, is there a new tool I can use here for this? Or is there a new way I can do this? Or have I brought in a new participant into my ecosystem who's contributing in some way? So honestly, Regen has left everything very, very open. This whole thing of action and practice-based methodology, they really want to live it. It's it and 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 practice it. They don't want it to be something that's already just a contract on paper and you've signed and then then there's no flexibility to change things up. And it's it's the beauty of the system. But you know, as as people, because we're used to education being a certain way, and we're used to always operating within structures and very defined structures. That can be a challenge, especially for people. I'll say it's less of a challenge for community people at the grassroots. It's more of a challenge for people like us who are very black and white in, in the way we uh, deal with systems and other things. So, so yeah. And your first question was about token mining. So that's exactly what I talked about, proof of work versus proof of stake. So Ethereum has now moved to proof of stake, which is 10 million times less energy intensive than proof of work blockchain. And there's a whole, um, there are lots of studies actually, but the I think it's the carbon, uh, Crypto Carbon Ratings Institute uh, 2022, they released a report basically talking about the energy efficiency and carbon footprint of proof of stake protocols and how much less it is. So that was another reason uh, Regen chose the Cosmos software development kit. They didn't choose any other kit because the other kits are all proof of work based and Regen wanted to make sure they were not just doing something that's already been done and something that has this energy efficiency tag to it. So yeah, so proof of stake blockchain is, is very much... Um, uh, is very much more energy efficient. In fact, it, it, yeah, it uses small computers and they're not miners. We don't call them miners. We call them validators and they're not solving any complex puzzles or anything using very supercomputers. All they have to do is have small computers. They are part of our community. All they need to have is tokens to participate. We give them the tokens to participate. They reward us by giving us a certain percentage of their earnings. And that's how the, the system keeps running. So the system also needs us to keep running. It keeps needing the CS DAOs and the communities to keep running. Regen by itself is not going to keep the network running. Yeah? So we would be working directly with, if all this goes through, we would be working directly with Regen Foundation, not network, ne not the network development side of things. That's a lot of the, that's the tech side of things. And I will share this PPT with all of you because, uh, you know, you, it takes time to chew on what's being said. And even though it might seem like similar things are said on all the slides, there's a slight, <laughs> there's a slight difference and that there is actually some reason for it. So, you know, it's very hard to do it in an hour. Uh, uh, and I've definitely struggled uh, with this, but I thought it was very important and I needed uh, to share it with you guys uh, because I really feel Seed Lab can benefit, uh, even if not in the next six months, but definitely in the next two years for sure. So yeah, anything else, guys? I have a whole bunch of uh, papers and other stuff. Maybe I could, uh, do we have a place where we put all this Nandini? Thank you, Anuja. Do we have a place where I can um, just put a folder? Yeah, put on Slack. On Slack, as in just post links on Slack? Does that mean it'll link to my Google uh, folder, drive folder? Yeah, you can link us and links to the drive folder. Okay, I'll do that because there's quite a bit. See, you know, these are all very pertinent questions about, you know, proof of stake versus proof of work and, and the old carbon market and nature-based uh, solutions and how that's all going. And there's 
there's a linkage of Google Drive and Slack. Yeah, Nuja, I've, I've used that. I was just wondering whether we as a Canopy Collective have a particular Google Drive space. C Lab uh, has a particular Google Drive, but uh, we might close this and start a new Canopy Collective email ID in Google Drive. Uh, so maybe when that happens, or no, I'll just share mine. It doesn't matter. For now, I'll just share. I'll just share my uh, my drive because there's a lot of reading you can do. But I would honestly uh, ask you all not to just randomly Google stuff because you're just going to get more confused. It took us a while to plow through all the information out there. And um, that's how, you know, we've created FAQs for Regen. We've created so many things that the new cohort that comes on board will have ready. As a cohort, uh, as cohort one, we really had nothing. And these are the kinds of questions we had, even about what governance means, code of conduct, code of communication, a lot of the um, um, conversations that we've had within Seed Lab uh, about protecting people and about people feeling uh, looked after and cared for and all these things. These are all conversations we've had in region and we're in the, uh, we are, some things are ready, but some things we're still writing right now. So uh, once Seed Lab comes on board, you'll be privy to all these things as well, which I think will really help us as, as Seed Lab to us, Canopy Collective too. So yeah. Anything else? If no one else has any more questions, uh, we can wrap this up. Cool. Thank you so much for listening, guys. I know it's been a mouthful, so I'm very, very grateful to all of you for listening so patiently to all of, to me. And please, please, please reach out with more questions. And as soon as I figure out drive and everything, I'm going to post that link so that you all can read more stuff.